about to introduce, has served South Lake for almost the last two years as our representative. Prior to that, he was in a different district up in the north. Um, he's done a lot of good things for us. He's always there. He's always willing to talk to us if we have questions and concerns. It's my privilege to introduce member of the Florida House of Representatives, Mr. Larry Metz. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you this morning. And thank you very much for the opportunity to represent you in the Florida House. I really appreciate it. It's a high honor and privilege to walk into that chamber in the, uh, and understand the importance of being there and know that I represent 157,000 people in Lake County, in Central and South Lake County. Um, I was elected to the Florida House in 2010 to District 25, which included the Golden Triangle as the main part of the district. And then in 2012, we had to redraw the boundaries of the districts, and so my district shifted to the south, and I ended up in District 32, which is all of Leesburg, and then everything south of Leesburg, uh, including Hokahumka, Howie the Hills, Yalaha, where I live, with my wife Mariko, uh, Astatula, and all the communities in South Lake County, all the way down to the border with Polk County. So it's a privilege to be your representative. And I just completed the session a week ago, Friday, and so there's a lot of things that I would like to talk to you about, but I don't have a lot of time for that today. I will be giving an update on the legislative session a week from yesterday at the South Lake Chamber, uh, Com South Lake Chamber of Commerce breakfast meeting, which will be held right in this room at 7.15 uh, next Friday. So I'll have more information then because I'll have a little more time. But I want to first of all just say, when I was running for the Florida House, and I did serve on the school board before that for six years, so I was not really a newcomer to public service at the time, but when I ran for this office, my fundamental guiding principles were to try to keep Florida a state with limited government, low taxes, and to emphasize more individual freedom and responsibility. These, I think, are core Republican values, and I believe in them from the beginning of my life. I've lived those types of principles, being self-sufficient and having a strong work ethic as a young uh, teenager, and then uh, going to the University of Florida and majoring in political science, serving my country in the United States Marine Corps, four years active duty and two years in the reserves, then going on to law school and beginning a family with Mariko. We have two daughters that are now 30 and 28. So we've been through the, all, the, all the stages of life with children, and we're very proud of our daughters who went to Lake County Public Schools and now and graduated from national universities and served their country in the United States Navy for six years each as, as service warfare officers in all over the world on combat ships, and uh, both served in the Middle East and came back and then both are pursuing graduate degrees. Actually, my oldest daughter uh, graduated from Harvard Business School last year and she's working in the private sector now. And her sister is in graduate school. So these are the things that have grounded me and I think made me a better representative being a family man and a long time conservative and a practicing attorney for 30 years and have an office of useless. And when I went to Tallahassee, I wanted to apply the principles that I mentioned to you work that I did. And one of the things I believe in very firmly is that the, the title of representative is not just the title, it's the job description. When you represent 157,000 people, you can't possibly have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with all of them. But you have to reach out to your district and try to find out what's on their minds so that you can represent them accurately and well. And so every year, uh, I've done this now for four years, before the session comes up, which is once a year in March, typically, for 60 days, I rounded my district. Now I go all through the district, all through the two-year term, when I'm out at Chamber of Commerce meetings and community events like the South Lake 912 Project, the Lake County Republican Executive Committee, anywhere that I'm invited to speak, if I can be there because my calendar allows it, I'm there. So I reach out to my district that way. But also, before the session begins, I like to touch in with the public officials that are also elected, because I believe through their election, they're representing the same people that I am. So I try to round with the county commissioners one-on-one, -on -one, school board members, um, mayors and city managers in all the cities in my district. I call it rounding, and I try to reach out to them and find out what's on their minds so that when I'm in Tallahassee, I understand what's of concern to them. And I've had a lot of good input from our local officials, uh, Lake Sumter State College, uh, the hospitals meet with me. I get a lot of really good input from them, and that's what I do when I'm in Tallahassee. I try to effectuate the feedback that I've received overall in the district. Now, in this particular year, uh, every year before this, actually, I have six bill slots that I can file bills as a House member. Senators don't have a limit, but we have a six-member, six-bill member limit. 
So um, you have to be very careful what you are going to take on because you can only have six of them. Well, I'm proud to say that a lot of my bills in every session have come right from the district. It's not like I go to Tallahassee and some lobbyist corners me and says, could you run a bill for us? And I look at it and say, oh, I agree with that. I'll run the bill help some lobbyists with the bill. I like to run bills that are organic to my district. That's what I've done. I'll give you one example here. And this is important because I'm asking you to reelect me in November to another two-year term. I'm trying to explain to you how I approach my duties. I had a call last year from a Korean War veteran in Leesburg who said this group of Korean War veterans were concerned about the fact that in Florida statutes and on the license plate that the Florida statutes allow to have a license plate for, uh, it says Korean conflict. And he said, our veterans didn't fight in the conflict, we fought in the Korean War. And we're quite offended that they call it the Korean conflict in law and on the plate. So could you help us with that? So I reached out to him and did some research, and uh, sure enough, it said Korean conflict in statute, and the license plate said Korean conflict. And I also noted that it said Vietnam era in the law for the Vietnam War, which I think is probably more oppressive than Korean <coughs> conflict, it's called the Vietnam War, the Vietnam era in the law. So we ran a bill, put together a bill, and um, we changed all those references to Korean War, Vietnam War, and the license plate as well, and also the Freedom of Combat Medical License Badge, since that had been overlooked previously. And we ran that bill through the House and got it through all the committees and the House floor unanimously. Our Senate sponsor did likewise, and that bill is on its way to Governor Scott, isn't that? So it's a constituent contacting a representative, a representative listening to that constituent and working through the process through the entire legislative cycle. And we're going to have a law that I think Governor Scott would be very proud to sign that will give those veterans their, their just recognition for what they did for our country. And I can name other bills like that. I don't have time to explain them, but we did one for the Lake County Water Authority where there was people that were digging up the land that the public owns there, looking for our arrowheads and such. And there was no protection in law for those properties. We ran a bill last year which was the second year that we did that. Senator Hayes and I did that one. We got that in the law. So I'm trying to be responsive to the constituents in my district, the specific bills that originate in the district. And at the same time, when the bigger picture bills come along, I have to vote on them, apply those principles of limited government, lower taxes, and greater individual freedom and responsibility as a mantra for my, for my deciding how to vote for 157,000 people. And I can't possibly reach out to them instantaneously to get their input. And that's the job that I've done for you and what I intend to do in the future. So I'm hopeful that you'll allow me the honor to continue serving for the next two years by re-electing me as your representative of District 32. Now, I would like to take, if I have any time left, if I don't, uh, I'd prefer you to tell me. We have a, a couple questions oh. that were put together okay. by the uh, members of the South Lake Land Code Project okay. that they'd like you to answer. Thank you. Uh, what were the three most significant accomplishments of the state legislature during this session? Okay, thank you. Well, number one, I would have to say the budget is always going to be number one on that because it's the one thing that we have to do under the Constitution. We passed a balanced budget of $77 billion, and of that, $3.1 billion is in reserves, as Senator Hayes mentioned, for, for very valid fiscal responsibility reasons. Uh, we provided tax relief of $500 million. $400 million of that is rolling back the 2009 increases in your motor vehicle registration fees. It was only right and proper that we do that. Too often, government uses a crisis as an excuse to raise your taxes and they say, well, it's you know tough times, we have to do something. And then when tough times recede and we get to good times, very rarely does government walk it back and say, okay, we don't need that money now. We're going to absorb it into our budget and keep it forever. Well, this year, the legislature and Governor Scott agreed that we we're going to roll back those 2009 increases in the public motor vehicle registration fees. So that accounts for $400 billion of that $500 million in tax relief. The other $100 billion is roughly divided up into three tax holidays, one for back to school, one for uh, hurricane preparedness, and one for um, energy efficient appliances. And there are different periods of time. We'll be getting some information out on that. But that puts back money in your pocket, too, when you go to the store and buy these things for your children or your, your house or whatever to get ready for a storm season. So that was number one. Number two, uh, we had a very serious problem, which you probably saw highlighted in the Orlando Sentinel articles about a year ago, about these predators, these sexual predators that are locked up and then get out early and re-offend all the time. I think there were over 400 instances where offenders were released early and then re-offended, some on the very day they were let out. So 
the Orlando Sentinel's investigative reporting illuminated this problem. The legislature responded with a series of bills, which is very important, I think. That's why I listed as one of the top three. It's about public safety, after all. And so one of the things we did was toughen the sentencing and the ability to release these people so that they're going to serve more of their time. There's a 50-year minimum sentence for the worst offenders, the ones that are sexually abusing a child under 12 or elderly or disabled people. So those penalties are very stiff. There's also strengthening of the civil commitment process so that they can't be let out if they are a danger to the public, even if they serve their time, under the theory that they're a danger to themselves or to others and can't let them roam the streets. There's a way to keep them in with some very important procedural safeguards built into that. So that was number two. Um, no, I think number, I said number one is the budget, number two is public safety. I do think I would put the, it's number three, the tax relief I mentioned as part of the budget because that was actually not just an annual budget decision, that was a permanent reduction of the fees that we're talking about. So that would be, I think, my answer to that. Thank you. The second question is, what is your position on Article 5 calling for a constitutional convention? Okay, if there was ever a softball question, that, that was it right there. <laughs> because and it's an important issue, but it happens to be that I was the sponsor in the House at that very uh, point. And Senator Hayes was the sponsor like in the Senate. Right. So uh, what it does, okay, Article 5 of our, of our U.S. Constitution establishes two ways to amend the U.S. Constitution. One is Congress can propose amendments by passing them by a two-thirds vote, and then they go to the states for the ratification, either by the legislatures or by conventions in the states to ratify them. That has uh, been the only one that's ever been used up until this point. And there have been some amendments that Congress has passed that the states have ratified, the most recent one having to do with increases in congressional pay. You have to have an intervening election before that can take place. Uh, the other method in Article 5 is the states themselves petitioning Congress to call a convention of the states, where the states can then propose amendments back to themselves for ratification. That has never been used before. What Senator Hayes and I did is we sponsored a memorial, he in the Senate, me in the House, a memorial to the Congress. It's a, it's a word that's used to describe a message, if you will, that we would send as a legislature to Congress. And we passed that off the Senate floor and off the House floor this year that made Florida the third state in the country. I thought we were the second, but I think that Alaska might beat us to it. Uh, in any event, we're in the top three there. Third state in the country to call on Congress to have a state, a convention of the states for the purpose of proposing amendments in three subject areas. Number one, limiting the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Number two, imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government. <coughs> Number three, imposing term limits on members of Congress and federal officials. Three subject areas. <laughs> now what happens, what has to happen next is we have to get to 34 states doing that. And by the way, this is part of a national movement called the Convention of States Project, the Citizens for Self-Governance, COS, Convention of States. There's websites on this, so you can find it. But the memorials were drafted with some coordination so that we don't end up with 34 different versions of the memorial. We can have different warehouse clauses and so forth, but the three subjects need to be lined up. And so the three states that I mentioned, Georgia, Florida, and Alaska, have the same language on those three subject matters. If we can get to 34 states, Congress will have to call the convention. Now, one thing I want to mention about this, because I know it's on everyone's mind, is what about the runaway convention? Why are we risking our Constitution this way? Well, first of all, we risk it every day that Congress is in session. They can pass any amendment they want to send it to us. And we have to ratify it by a three-fourths margin. 38 states have to ratify it, which is a huge bar. So, I don't think, I'm, any, I'm, I am not nearly as worried about the citizens of states coming together for a convention of the states proposing amendments, as I am Congress proposing them, and they can do that right now, so that's one thing. But the 38 state threshold for ratification is a huge protector of any bad amendment that might get through. And besides, at what point do you say that we're on a collision course with the future if you don't think that, uh, that the accumulated public debt that we've reached at this point in our country's history, over $16 trillion in accumulated public debt, and no end in sight to deficits for the next 10 years, when do you reach the point where you say it's a crisis mode and we have to do something? I mean, I see it coming with 16 trillion, 16.3 trillion. It was 16 trillion when I started drafting this last year. It's 16.3 trillion now. We've got to do something to reverse the course 
of this country. And this Article 5 Convention of the States, if it happens, will be that opportunity. But more importantly, if we get close to it happening, that will be the pressure point on Congress to perhaps get things in order. And maybe Congress will then send us the amendments that we need, like a balanced budget amendment, like the line out of the president, like term limits for Congress, like limits on the federal government's jurisdiction to regulate our lives in the states. So I'm sorry I took so long, but I feel very passionately about that. It's the thing that we can do in Florida that would affect the course of the country's future nationally, other than electing good senators and representatives to go to Congress. But this is the only thing else we have to play. We need to be very serious about it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, last question is a little bit long, so I'll go through it then. I might turn into a sense. Uh, more and more land in the state is taken from the private sector and allocated to government entities at the state, local, and federal level. For example, 40% of Lake County is now owned by a governmental entity and thus taken off the tax rolls. Should there be limits to the amount of land under the sole management of government? Thank you. Uh, that's an interesting question. And I want to roll back the uh, history of that a little bit because back before Preservation 2000, which was Governor Bob Martinez's initiative in the 1980s, before that time, when government looked at a piece of property and said there's something about that that we want to protect, whether it's environmentally sensitive or has historical significance or whatever, government would simply regulate it away from the owner. They would use the power of regulation to get what they wanted, and the owner was left with whatever was left, which sometimes wasn't much. And sometimes the owners would have to go to court at their own expense and file a suit for inverse condemnation and argue that the government regula regulation on their land was a taking and that they're entitled to just compensation under the Constitution. But that put the property owner with the burden of going against the government. You know about fighting city hall and how expensive that could be. So what Governor Martinez said was, basically, if we're going to have land that's important to the government, let's have the government buy it. And that's what the government started doing, buying land instead of taking it. So I support that concept over the regulation of landowner rights. But at some point, we have to be mindful of the public purpose for having that in off the tax rolls and in public ownership. And I think that's a matter for the uh, officials to look at on an ad hoc basis, meaning on a case-by-case -case basis. We shouldn't simply be buying land and adding it to the roll, taking off the tax rolls and adding it to the governor, government property uh, list without having a valid public purpose. If there's a valid public purpose for that, then I say fine, but let government pay for it and let the owner be fully compensated. Don't ever do it with regulatory takings. That's a violation of private property rights that I can't support. So I think I would not say that we should have an artificial limit. Like at some point, you know, this is a limit we can't ever have any more property again. But government has to just be responsible for what it owns and be accountable for that. And that's where the legislature has to exercise oversight responsibility. Transparency, oversight, and accountability are three things that I think are very important role for government to government officials to follow, not just to buy it and let it sit there forever, but to make sure you go back and look at it as to why you bought it and why you need it. And that's what I think we need to do more of. Well, we certainly appreciate you spending some time with us today. Thank you. Um, and um, are you going to be around for the break? Yes, I will. But I okay. want to just leave one more thought about Governor Scott, because Senator Hayes covered this very well, but I just want to mention to you something else to consider here about Governor Scott's re-election and how imperative it is that we re-elect Governor Scott. The next governor, whether it's Governor Scott in his second term or somebody else in their first term, will likely be appointing four justices of the Florida Supreme Court. One in 2017 and the other three at the end of that term in 2019, actually January. So think about the effect that that next governor will have on the future of Florida with those appointments. That's, that is reason enough to re-elect Governor, re Governor Scott. If he had no other reason at all, that's enough. But on top of that, in 2018, it will be the time for the 20-year Constitution Revision Commission in Florida, where a commission of people appointed by the governor, by the presiding officers, will come together to, re to look at Florida's state constitution and perhaps rewrite it or propose amendments to it. And the next governor will get a number of appointments to that commission. So again, if Governor Scott is re-elected, he'll be making a lot of those appointments, which will be very important in the future of Florida. So I just want to leave those two things with you. Very, very important. We've got to re-elect Governor Scott. Thank you very much.